Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, let me just start by thanking the organizing committee, planning committee, standing committees, all the committees for putting this together and for inviting me to, to kick it off. And I think the opening remarks really have teed me off well. You're going to hear a lot of um, similar themes in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so my task is to give you an overview on the state of knowledge on microplastics and their, Im and their impact on um, environmental health. Sorry, I have to learn the clicker. OK. Um, so I'm going to start by just posing the question of why are we here, all of us here today, taking time out of our really busy schedules to talk about microplastics in the environment? Why now? Why in 2020? And thinking about this from really a 70-year perspective. So what I've showed here is a plot of global plastics production since 1950, which is the nominal start of plastics production globally. Um, and you see that in the blue line all the way up through 2016. And what you'll see is that that line increases really steeply. And in fact, the production of plastics has outpaced that of any other bulk material, including steel, cement, um, and aluminum. So if we actually add up the area under that curve to estimate how, many, how much plastics have been produced globally since 1950, that adds up to 8.3 billion metric tons. This is work led by Roland Geyer. Um, that number is so huge that I can't give it to you in Empire State Buildings or Blue Whales or Super Bowl stadiums. Um, it's really hard to wrap your brain around what that number means. Um, if you look at the other curve there, that's a red line. That's showing you plastic waste generation, also in million metric tons. And that curve looks almost identical to the blue one. It's slightly offset. Um, it's offset because some plastics we use do have long lifetimes, but the uh, majority of plastics have very short lifetimes and become plastic waste very quickly. And we estimated that of that 8.3 billion metric tons, about 70% of those plastics have already become waste. Only 9% have been recycled, only 12% have been incinerated, and that leaves the vast majority either sitting in landfills or somewhere in the natural environment. So if you put that number together with the plastics that we're all using today, that means that about 90% of that 8.3 billion metric tons are still in existence on the planet somewhere. Well, if we look at this from an environmental perspective, it wasn't long after this sort of commercial production started that, that plastics were detected in the marine environment. And this is a hard photo to look at, but it's a seabird that was found in 1966 with plastic debris in its gut. So that was when global plastic production was at 5% of current levels. A few years later, in the early 1970s, small bits of plastic were found floating first in the North Atlantic Ocean, and then in the North Pacific Ocean. Larger debris was also found floating, plastic debris floating in the North Pacific Ocean. That's when production was about 10% of current production levels. So my organization, Sea Education Association, we're a small nonprofit in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Um, we run a sea semester program where undergraduates go out and study the ocean from a variety of perspectives aboard our tall sailing ships. And starting um, as early as the late 1970s, but really um, in the mid-1980s, we were documenting plastics floating in the, in the uh, North Atlantic Ocean, and our first scientific publication was in 1987. Well, let's fast forward to 2003. In 2003... Uh, Charles Moore, who's an avid environmentalist and sailor, wrote an article for Natural History magazine documenting what he described of his view from the, ship, uh, from the deck of his ship sailing in the North Pacific Ocean. And he described, quote, as far as the eye can see, the sight of plastic. And it was in this article that oceanographer Curtis Ebesmeyer tried to explain why there might be a lot of plastic in this area, and that term, the garbage patch, uh, was coined. Well, it didn't take too long after that, after the birth of the garbage path, for it to grow into this true phenomenon. Uh, you heard things like twice the size of Texas, three times the size of France, more plastic than plankton, a floating landfill or a floating island so large that you could see it from space. So if anybody in this room still has this image in your mind, I'm going to ask you to please purge it permanently. It is a really sticky notion, and that's because it's, it's an image that you can wrap your brain around. You can imagine trash floating that we've all produced floating in this um, remote environment. So this is not what it looks like, but it stuck, and it really started raising awareness, I think, in the public and the media about this idea that plastics, which had been produced and been in the environment for decades, um, were actually contaminating our oceans. Well, a few years later, I think we saw another spike in interest when photographer Chris Jordan went to Midway Atoll 
and published these photos of albatross chicks that had very recognizable plastic trash in their bellies. So here you see this albatross chick with a cigarette lighter um, and a bottle cap. And this really became, I think, sort of the poster child for this topic. Well, if there's no floating island out there, we, we know that there are clearly is contamination in the oceans. We know that wildlife is being impacted. So what does it actually look like in areas of the ocean described as garbage patches? Well, I mentioned our sea semester students. So our students have been sailing on our tall oceanographic research vessels since 1971, conducting oceanographic research. And if you go out on one of our ships in the North Pacific Ocean or the North Atlantic Ocean in these areas, what you typically see is water and sky. You really barely even see other ships. Hopefully you get to see some charismatic megafauna, some whales and dolphins, flying fish. Of course, we're measuring different organisms that are in the ocean. Um, you then might be pretty surprised to look over the side of the boat and see something drifting by that just doesn't belong there, something like a boot or a bucket or a toothbrush, a teapot, a kayak, or a, just a really big chunk of what's clearly plastic, but you don't really know what kind of object this came from. And this is really shocking, and it's disgusting, because you're in a place where you figure this has got to be one of the most pristine places on Earth, thousands of miles from where any human populations are. What are these objects, most of which probably came from land, doing out there in the middle of the ocean? It is appalling, but it is really far from being a floating landfill. Well, the picture changes quite a bit if you tow a plankton net at the sea surface for just 30 minutes, which thousands of our students have done twice a day, every day for decades. They tow that net for 30 minutes, pour the contents into a sieve, and then use tweezers to pick out things of interest. So largely, organisms um, is what we're looking for, um, but also finding things that look like this, so microplastics. Um, this is a photo of a sieve from a net tow in the North Atlantic Ocean. And students spend a lot of time with tweezers picking out what are presumed to be plastics. I say presumed because we don't actually have chemical identification tools on board the ships. But what you can see is these particles are brightly colored. They're irregularly shaped. They usually have quite firm textures. It turns out that the human eye, looking at particles of this size, is really, really good at defining synthetic materials from organic matter, which tends to be more brownish, goopyish, clearish stuff. Um, OK, but this, you know, so we can kind of do this and say, we feel pretty good that these are plastics. And we've since gone back and, and actually chemically analyzed thousands of these particles and confirmed that, yes, our undergraduates do a really good job picking out plastics. But what really are microplastics? What is the technical definition? The really highly scientific consensus definition of microplastics is small bits of plastic. <laughs> so, so we don't have a technical definition, and I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about why that is. Uh, so historically, microplastics were really first described using size criteria. So I'm showing here just this... Um, you know, log scale of different, different sizes of things that we're familiar with. And the first definitions of microplastics had a maximum size of five millimeters. I'll talk about why in a second. And really had an operational minimum size of the size of the mesh of the plankton that used to collect them, which is about 335 microns. So it's worth saying that we were using plankton nets not to collect plastic. We were using them to collect plankton. So this really was opportunistic data that people were reporting on back in the 70s, 80s. Um, you know, and even today. So, so this size criteria um, was based at least initially on sort of the method of observation. And as we've used finer and finer meshes in our nets or finer and finer filters on using bulk water, filtering bulk, bulk water samples, we're finding that those particles, of course, are small. And, and we can find smaller and smaller particles potentially down into the nanoscales, as was mentioned earlier, though we don't have great methods to do that yet. So I would say typically microplastics collectively with nanoplastics are still defined by size, but those size definitions vary by the investigator using them. So um, common but not consistent. So I'm showing here a photo of, um, again, plastics collected in one of our plankton net samples just to illustrate the fact that these particles have widely, probably infinite shapes. Um, so there are some common shape categories. You actually can see um, right here there are a couple of industrial resin pellets, so sort of the raw material of plastic products. And in fact, those are what set this maximum um, size limit in the initial definition to make sure that those industrial resin pellets were captured in the definition of microplastics. Um, so those are industrial resin pellets. Um, most of the other 
uh, items that you see here are fragments of things. So we have categories called fragments. We have categories called line, film, things like, um, you know, that you think of like a plastic bag film. Um, and some of those categories are intended to try to give you some information about their source. So resin pellets is a category. These are manufactured in this size. Cosmetic microbeads are another example of, of plastics manufactured in that microplastic size range. Um, but the, the majority of the other particles are produced by fragmentation from larger objects. And it is essentially impossible to figure out the origin of those particles, of those fragments, either by geographic origin, you can't say this came from the US or this came from China, you can't tell what type of object it came from, with the exception possibly of monofilament fishing line. Um, there's also a category, though, of even smaller particles that are produced from wear. And uh, these were just uh, re referenced in the earlier intro. Those are things like the textile fibers um, and tire wear particles, which you actually do not see in this um, photo because those are too small for us to capture. OK, so we know a little bit of sometimes about the source, um, but not a whole lot. We know that these microplastics can be made up of really hundreds of types of polymers, of synthetic polymers. I'm showing here this. Um, familiar re resin identification codes that we find on all of our plastics products. So we can identify the polymer type, but it's important to note that um, a number two high-density polyethylene milk jug is not chemically the same as a number two detergent bottle. And that's because these polymers, these products, are created with a wide suite of chemical additives, which are proprietary formulations that give the product its properties and its usefulness, things like flexibility or color, resistance to microbial colonization, et cetera. So I think it's really important to remember that microplastics are not a single thing. There's not a single agreed upon definition. And that's because they're really a diverse and complex category of contaminants. And that's made even more complicated by the fact that those characteristics evolve when they're exposed in the environment. So these particles will become smaller over time when they're exposed to UV radiation and continue fragmenting. Um, their, their shape will change, and their chemical composition will change. So microplastics, I think, are a big focus, at least from the environmental science community, because of their abundance and the fact that they're so widespread. So I'm showing here a few photos um, from just the marine environment, because that's where I spend most of my time, um, showing microplastics on beaches, in the water column, both floating but also deeper in the water column. They've been found buried in deep sea sediments. They've been found in Arctic sea ice. But they've been found far beyond the marine environment. They've been found in freshwater environments, including lakes, rivers, and streams, in terrestrial environments, including agricultural and other types of soils. Um, they're found in the air. They're found in snow. They're found in drinking water. They're found in tap water. They're found in wastewater, in storm water. Um, these particles are very abundant and widespread. And I would argue that the smaller the particle, probably be, once they can become transported in the air, the probably more abundant and widespread they become. Um, so an important point is that although the mic microplastics are abundant and widespread throughout the environment, that does not mean that they are in, that they are uniformly distributed. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of, of two data sets from the ocean to illustrate this point. So the first is a map uh, from data collected by uh, sea semester students in the western North Atlantic Ocean. So to orient you, here's North America, South America, here's the Caribbean Sea. Bermuda's right in here. Um, what you're seeing is each dot represents a single plankton net toe. I have this little photo here to remind you how we're, how we're measuring these concentrations. And the color indicates plastics uh, concentration in pieces per square kilometer. Blues are low values. The darkest blue is zero. And the highest values are reds and those black stars and green star that you see. So when we look at a map like this, you can see that, in fact, microplastics are widespread. But those warm colors really are concentrated in a latitude range of between about 20 and 40 degrees north. So we, we don't see every single highest value in that latitude range. But most of them are there. All of the, the black stars are located there. And we can actually explain this using ocean physics, which is my background. So we know that the winds blow on the surface of the, earth, on the, surface of the ocean and, and impart momentum, and the, the earth is turning. And this sets up these gyre systems that are basin scale systems. And if a piece of that is sort of a convergence zone centered on 30 degrees north that brings those plastics and other floating debris together and sort of slows them down into kind of an oceanographic dead end. So we can look at a map like this and make a pretty good argument about the pattern that we're observing. If I show you our data from the Eastern Pacific Ocean, which now spans a much broader latitude range, we're going from 20 south to 50 degrees north, 
you can see this pattern even more clearly. So in that 20 to 40 degree north range, again, we see those highest concentrations. That's the subtropical gyre of the North Pacific Ocean. But what's nice is here, since here we have the equator, you can see in the tropics, they're actually really low values. So it, it again, sort of reinforces this idea that ocean circulation can explain this pattern. Now, it's important to note that this doesn't explain everything you're seeing in these images. If you go into, oh, I should back up at a very important point, these are the garbage patches. When we're talking about garbage patches, it's the accumulation of these small bits of microplastics accumulating because of the ocean currents. So again, not, no floating islands. Even if you go into these accumulation zones or garbage patches, there are toes where we get zero plastic. And even if you go in the tropics, there are toes where we find plastic. So there is immense variability even within this large-scale pattern. OK, so try to sort of picture this as I go to the next image, which is um, another, this is actually a global map now of data collected by uh, citizens affiliated with the Adventure Scientist Program. So they had a global microplastics initiative in which volunteers took one liter water samples, so I'm showing the characteristic Nalgene bottle here, that were then sent to a lab in Maine and filtered by a very dedicated scientist, Abby Barrows. Um, and those filters were now 0.45 microns in size. So this data set is fundamentally different from the one I just showed you. If you think about the smallest particle that can be collected in the plankton net from the previous um, slide, that is 750 times bigger than the smallest particle that can be measured using this method. Well, let's look at the pattern um, of these data. So what you see is all the orange dots show samples containing plastic, and those range from one or two pieces, particles of plastic, to over 500. So the bubble size indicates that uh, variability. And then, of course, the zeros show places where there is no plastic. So you can't go anywhere and always measure plastic. If you look at the patterns here, it doesn't really bear any resemblance to what we looked at in the previous slide. So you definitely see some highs and lows. But in fact, here, we're more in the tropics. Of course, there's a lot more data there. Um, so my point being that um, you really have to be you have to know what you're looking at when you're dealing with microplastics data. So first, a microplastic is not a microplastic is not a microplastic. Let's take home message number one. And number two, even though microplastics can be found globally, they're very widespread. They're not everywhere in the same amounts. OK, why do we care about microplastics? Um, I'm sure I don't need to tell you this. Uh, the, the biggest concern is that microplastics are small enough that they can be ingested. And they can be ingested by animals as small as zooplankton. They can be ingested by invertebrates. These are gooseneck particles living on this buoy that had all these plastics in them. They can be ingested by fish and marine mammals. And you name it, and they can pretty much be ingested by um, the whole suite of marine animals that eat things that are particles. Um, about 220, more than 220 species of marine animals have been found to ingest plastic particles. And of course, it depends on what size the particle is and what size the animal is as to what it's ingesting, what the impacts are. So a whale that eats a flower pout and car parts could suffer severe internal damage. Uh, if we're thinking about the seabird with a belly full of bottle caps, you can imagine false sati satiation. They could be starving. If you start to think about microplastics, the impacts may be more along the lines of inflammation or potentially transferring if the particles are small enough across cell membranes. So there's a wide variety of impacts that we're concerned about. And this is complicated by the fact that these plastics are associated with a whole um, complex array of chemicals, chemicals that were either byproducts of manufacture, added during manufacture, or that might sorb to the particles when they're in the environment. So legacy contaminants like DDTs and PCBs. So many of these chemicals are known to be potentially harmful to um, organisms. And the concern, of course, is that if you eat a piece of plastic that's covered in all of these chemical contaminants, that those chemicals will transfer into the anim animal tissue and cause harm. This has been shown for a number of animal plastic chemical combinations in the laboratory. But, but what do we know about what's actually happening in nature from microplastics that are being ingested? Well, this is from a recent paper out of Chelsea Rockman's lab. Uh, looking at the, uh, it's a critical review of the scientific literature to identify the demonstrated evidence of impacts in organisms in marine, freshwater, and terrestrial environments. So it's a little bit of a complicated um, plot here, but what you're seeing is two different figures showing the size of debris from nanoscales up to kilometers, things like fishing nets. 
Um, and that's as a function of level of biological organization on which the effect was being examined. So things all the way from the ecosystem level down to cell metabolic particles. And if anybody can explain to me what that means, because I'm not a biologist, that would be great. Um, so anyway, impacts along all of these biological levels of biological organization. And the shading is indicated, indicating from the literature um, instances in which a particular effect was tested and detected on the left or tested and found to, and not detected. So no effect was found. So this was a very comprehensive review, and there certainly are studies showing impacts. But when we look at uh, microplastic studies, which, is, which are those to the left of this, nominally to the left of this red line, they, test, they found that there were studies that affected 421 effects. In 47 of those cases, the effect was demonstrated. There was evidence of that impact. And in 53% of cases, there was no effect detected. So this just demonstrates that the jury is still out. We cannot make these broad generalizations about microplastics and harm to animals um, or to the environment. Well, it's, the evidence of harm to animals is reason for concern for, for scientists and the public alike, but I think really the ante was up when we started seeing studies like these that were referred to earlier. So evidence that um, the things that we eat and drink are containing microplastics, seafood, bottled water, beer, tap water, tea, honey, salt, sugar. Um, I think that at this point, you know, we know that there is potential contamination of the things that we're consuming, of the air that we are breathing. The question is, okay, well, is there evidence that we are actually taking these up? And last year, there was this very preliminary study published looking at eight participants from different geographies with different diets. And it was found that microplastics were in all of their samples of human stool. So yeah, we're consuming these things. Now I think the next question is, are we retaining them and are they causing harm? Well, the concern is high enough that the World Health Organization commissioned a study to look at microplastics in drinking water. This is led by Bart Coleman, who's here today. And the I'm sure carefully crafted statement was that based on this limited body of evidence, firm conclusions associated with this on the risk uh, cannot yet be determined. However, at this point, no data suggests overt health concerns associated with exposure. Okay, so this was, a caref I'm sure, a carefully crafted statement, and this is how it was interpreted in the media. Everything from the WHO that sort of said, more research needed, let's crack down on plastic pollution. Some people picked up on that. Then there's, uh, well, microplastics are there, but they're not a risk for now. Present low risk. And then all the way down to, don't worry about it, just keep drinking your water. So I think there's really this big question broadly in all kinds of communities about, are we safe? All right, this raises an important point about the dis dif differentiating between contamination and impact. Um, let me, so we have documented widely contamination in the environment and in things that we eat, drink, and breathe by microplastics. And in some cases, contamination is enough to be able to sort of demonstrate an impact. And in this case, this is a sea lion that had this packing strap around its neck, and there's clearly a negative impact. When we're talking about seafood or some of these other mechanisms by which we're exposed to microplastics, we don't yet have the evidence to say whether or not we are being harmed. So I think that's really what's driving a lot of this workshop. I'm running out of time. I'm just going to squ skip quickly here through major knowledge gaps, which I think I've touched upon throughout this intro. Um, we really still don't know how much microplastic is in the environment. Most of the studies are pretty singular measurements in a particular time or place of whatever people are measuring. I don't think we have a sense of what that, in that variability is, even if in one particular place of what can be found. Um, we don't know where it's coming in. We don't know how these particles are being transported very well. Of course, we don't know the characteristics. There's a wide suite of characteristics we'd be interested in knowing, all of these to sort of inform exposure and potential impact, which I think is where we're largely headed in terms of our concern. Um, a big question is how are these materials transformed in the environment and what is their ultimate fate? Do these microplastics just get smaller and smaller and smaller over time to sort of infinitely small particles? Or are they ultimately um, remineralized through photodegradation processes or even potentially through uh, microbial biodegradation? And of course, the ultimate question, what are its impacts on wildlife and environmental and human health? 
Well, despite all of these gaps, we, there's been a tremendous amount of research in the past decade. We know so much more than we did when I first started working on this topic. And as a result of all that work, I think um, there's a wide consensus that we know enough to act to try to work towards these solutions to prevent plastics from entering the environment, to prevent these exposures. And you see these solutions at all levels, from international bodies to national um, actions, even in the U.S., all the way down to local scales with our our local trash and splash project in Falmouth, trying to tell people there are alternatives to single-use plastics, for instance, or picking up litter off the streets. So actions are happening, and, and I think that's in general a good thing. But I'm sure we would all agree that really the path to solutions should be informed by the best available science. And that's why we're here today, to understand where we are in our understanding and how we can efficiently and productively move that understanding forward to answer those questions about risks and impacts to human health and to the environment. So with that, I look forward to the upcoming discussions. I thank you very much. Kara did such a nice job of staying to her time that we do have maybe four minutes or so if people wanted to ask her any questions. Um, we have microphones here on either side if anybody wanted to pose a question for her. Sorry to be the only one. Um, I was walking slow to try to take a little time. So it's very hard to get up after a wonderful talk that just lays out these huge knowledge gaps and ask a question, do we know this or do we not know this? But could you say anything about, um, you know, plastic is, of course, extremely heterogeneous in terms of its additives. Um, but is there any kind of general initial thoughts about how much of those additives remain intact? you know, as in, in a very small particle after it's probably been in the water for mm -hmm. a long time, and to, to what extent, you know, kind of novel uh, contaminants are, are introduced into them? That's a great question. So I think as, as complicated as it is to try to take a set of individual particles and even identify their polymer type, it's even more challenging to get at the additive question because those formulations are typically proprietary. So you're kind of blindly searching for something you may not know even exists. Um, there are sort of broad categories of these, of these additives. And I'm not a chemist, so somebody here can probably answer that question in better detail than I can. Um, I think that's a, a real issue of concern. That 8.3 billion metric tons number um, did include additives. And that's a, a substantial number in there. I mean, it's a small percentage, but it is a very real sort of mass of, of a different type of material that we're putting into the environment and into organisms that are eating these particles. Um, but there are really big questions about, yeah, how stable are those additives within the plastics? And I think that's um, an area of active research to say, you know, some people are doing studies where they'll put the plastics in a solution and really just look at the leachates and say, what's, what's the impact of the leachates on the organisms as opposed to just the physical um, impacts of eating the particle or, or of, you know, ingesting it and having transfer within the animal. So I, as, as little as we know about even just the suite of polymers, I think we know even less about the suite of chemical additives. Thank you. Sneak in one more uh, uh, question here. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, yeah, great talk. This is Gary Ginsburg, New York State Department of Health. Um, sorry if I missed it, but did you say whether or not they can appear in drinking water supplies? Yes, there is evidence that microplastics are in drinking water. And we have uh, publicly available data on that? Uh, I could probably punt that one over to Bart, who I think is speaking next. He's the one who led that World Health Organization study on the microplastics in drinking water. I know there are, it was, a, again, a critical review of the literature, and what's available in the literature is certainly publicly available. There were relatively few studies that sort of passed the bar, I think, on that, that critical review. So that's wide open and certainly an area of concern. Okay, well then, unless there are any other super quick questions. All right, perfect. Well, Thanks. then I'll hand things over to uh, uh, Mark Hahn for the, uh, who'll be moderating the first session, but thanks again, Kara. Really appreciate it.